that that many prophecies would be fulfilled. Some of them are riding in on a colt on Palm Sunday. And another is it that he would be called Emmanuel. In Matthew 123, it says, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Just remember, he is here. Jesus is here. He is alive. He sits at the right hand of the Father, and he is with you no matter what. And singing God with us.
such a tiny offering compared to Calvary, but nevertheless, laid at your feet. All that is within me, He cries, for you alone. Be glorified, Emmanuel, God with us. My heart sings a brand new song. The debt is paid, these chains are gone, Emmanuel, God with us. Such a tiny offering compared to Calvary, nevertheless, you lay it at your feet. In such a time.
church member first service asked us to uh, pray for a little girl by the name of Sage who is battling cancer right now. And, um, you know, we can, we can hear a statement like that and be discouraged. We as believers know that the word says that Jesus said, greater things will you do because I go to my father. And so while we can hear news like that and be heartbroken, and, and we should, we have to also understand that in situations that are challenging or difficult, the Lord has given you authority. He's given you power. That, like we just saying about the blood of Jesus, that because of the blood of Jesus and the fact that you are a born-again child of God, that you are a born-again son or daughter of the Most High God, you have authority in this life, not because you've earned it, but because it was given to you by the one who has all power and all authority. And so because he has all power and authority and we've received his son and we have that power and authority, we're to exercise and use that power and authority. Amen. So before we, we, we pray for everybody here, we're going to pray and lift up that little girl, Sage. So let's just, let's just pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you right now in Jesus' name. And Lord, we lift up Sage and her entire family, Lord. Father, I just pray right now for them and, and wherever they are, Lord, that they experience your hope and your peace and your presence. But Lord, right now, we thank you for the power and the authority that we have in Jesus' name. And Lord, right now, in the name of Jesus, we curse and, dis and, com and command every cell, every cancerous cell in that little girl's body to die and be removed now in Jesus' name. That the same spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead dwells in us. And Jesus says, greater things will we do. Lord, we are standing on those promises right now. We are standing on your word right now, Lord. And Father, we are speaking life into Sage's body right now in Jesus' name. That cancer is not greater than the name of Jesus. That sickness and disease are not greater than the name of Jesus. And so, Lord, because of that, we speak healing and health into her physical body, Lord, right now in the name of Jesus. Amen. Where you are right now, let's just pray. If I were to ask you if you, if you need a touch of the Holy Spirit, I feel like many of us would say yes. I feel like we, we would desire that touch of the Holy Spirit. And how we know it's, not, it's God and not going to be man is because you're going to receive right now where you are in your seats. That not a single person is going to leave here the same way that they came. Not a single person is going to leave here the same way that they came. That depression has to leave in the name of Jesus. That sickness and disease has to leave in the name of Jesus. That brokenness has to leave in the name of Jesus. That, that poverty has to leave in the name of Jesus. And so if you believe that, and you believe and you are ready to receive from the Holy Spirit this morning, I'm going to ask where you are right now just to lift your hands. Let's pray. Father, we come to you right now again in Jesus' name. Uh, Lord, I pray for every one of your sons and daughters in this room right now. I thank you, Lord, that they are the head and not the tail, above and not beneath. And Lord, we just speak your blessing over them. Lord, I thank you for healing every single person in here that is battling a sickness, Lord, right now in Jesus' name. That even those in this room, Father, that are experiencing pain, that that pain must leave now in Jesus' name. Lord, I speak to everybody and I pray over everybody in this room, Lord, that is battling with depression and fear and anxiety, that, Lord, they must bow at the name of Jesus. And, Lord, I thank you for filling them up with your hope, that inside their spirit, man, Lord, is a, a, a wealth of hope and an amount of joy that is unfathomable. Lord, I just pray that right now that gets released into their physical bodies right now in this room, in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray for all the relationships in this place. I thank you, Lord, that there is nothing too far gone for Jesus. That, Lord, there is nothing impossible for you. And, Lord, we hold to those promises. Lord, we hold to those principles this morning. And, Lord, I thank you for mending relationships. I thank you for restoring what was broken. I thank you for healing those who were sick and afflicted. I, Lord, I thank you for instilling joy and peace in those that were depressed, Lord, but the joy of the Lord is now their strength. Lord, I thank you that not a single person in here this morning is going to leave without experiencing a touch of the Holy Spirit. And, Father, we know it's you because no one else is touching us but you. And so, Father, we thank you for receiving 
receiving these promises. We thank you, Lord, for your great love. That the only reason we can be here in this place and stand on your word and stand on your promises and receive from you is because you love us. And so, Father, this morning we receive your love. We receive your peace this morning, Lord. And we reject anything that's not from you and for you. We're going to hold to what your word says, Lord, that whom the Son sets free is free indeed. And Lord, I thank you that we are free. That this morning we are free from sickness, from disease, from depression, from brokenness, from past hurts, from past mistakes, because we are free because we have Jesus. Father, we love you. And we thank you, Lord, for preparing our hearts this morning for what you have for us. We receive it and we agree. And everybody who does says amen. Amen. Let's praise the Lord before we go any further. All right. Well, welcome to Christian Faith Center. I'm happy to see you. Some of you look happy to be here. Praise God. Before you have a seat, greet a few people nearby. Introduce yourself if you don't know them. Say good morning. God bless you. And let's have a seat. Good morning. Again, welcome to CFC. Everybody's on their way somewhere. Uh, quick announcement for the, uh, for the youth. Those are those folks 12 to 18, uh, our youth pastors on a missions trip, so no youth for the 12 to 18 year olds. They all left. Uh, they'll, they'll go have church downstairs. They've got a good youth pastor. They taught them how to have church, even when she's not here. All right. Um, any first time visitors? I want to welcome you here. All right, there's a hand there and one back there. Yes, good. We just want to welcome you and bless you. Thank you for coming out. And um, there's a few empty seats. So those of you who see an empty seat next to you next week, your homework is to bring somebody else with you. Um, next week is a big week, Sunday, right? It's Resurrection Sunday. Uh, we want you to invite somebody to come out. Um, if you're afraid to talk to people, we have flyers in the back. It's, it's, it's so that they can come here and... You know, you don't have to say the words if you're afraid. But you don't have any fear here, right? This is a faith zone, not a fear zone, right? You have the boldness of, of the Lord on you, and go out and just invite them. Like, people will come if you invite them. And if they don't come the first time, keep inviting them. You know, it, it's a good place to be. And start off by smiling at them. You know, that'll help a lot. All right, so um, for those of you who are new and, and may not know, we have lots of places, as you saw, people leaving earlier in the service we have, if you go that way, we have our, our um, we call them CFC beginners. Those are the kids three, four, and five. We also have a nursery that way. We also have a parent and child room if you want to go that way as well. If like, there's a TV in there for the parent child room, so if, if you need to, to be with your child. And then uh, we also have the, the CFC kids. Those are the five to 11 year olds down that way. Um, and everybody's going to get ministered to. It's not babysitting. I, I say it every week because I want you to know they're not just being babysat. They're, they're getting the word of God poured into them, and they're, they're part of our, our family, and they're part of our mission, right? We want them to grow as well. You know, we're here at CFC. We're here for you to connect, right? First of all, to connect with the word of God, to connect with God, our Father, and then connect with your brothers and sisters, right? We're all in this together. And as we're connecting, we want you to grow in relationship with the Father, grow in your knowledge of Him, and grow in the knowledge of who you are in Christ, right? And then you get to do the good part. You get to go out and be ministers. You all have a ministry, go out and minister. Like I say, you might have just a ministry of smiles, so go smile at somebody, and let them see the light of the Lord coming out of you. People will want to know why you're so happy. It's because you have the joy of the Lord upon you. That's why you're happy, right? And you come to a good church here, and you're going to be fed, and you're going to grow. So as we continue in our worship, we're going to go into our giving. And if you'd like to give, we have a couple of different ways you can give. Um, if you'd like to give in person, 
you raise your hand, one of our gifted and talented ushers will be glad to serve you an envelope. Um, you can also text the word GIVE to 973-529-8541. Once you get in there, it'll take you through the steps. And the best way, if you haven't already done so, download the church app. The church app will bless you in more ways than you can imagine. We have a pastor who's tech savvy. If you go to the church app, you get all of his sermon notes. You get all of the Wednesday grow groups notes. And in his sermon notes, where there's a Bible verse, you just tap the button. It takes you right to the Bible verse. So you don't have to remember which way to flip. If it's New Testament, Old Testament, it takes you right there. And there's a place where you can put your own notes in there so that you can go home and do the next part where you get to continue to feed on the Word of God and grow. All right? Um, I think we got all the ways to give. Last service, they had the, the big QR code that popped up. Well, we'll get it next time. They got it. It's tinyurl.com. All right. <clears throat> so this week, our verse is going to come from Psalms uh, chapter 37, verse 21. And I like to read out of the New King James. And it says, the wicked borrows and does not repay, but the righteous shows mercy and gives. Right? This is a pretty straightforward verse. You don't have to be a Bible scholar to know. It's basically saying, don't be selfish. Right? You, you give right? and, and don't borrow. And the word righteousness in the, in the Bible, it's, a, it's an important word. When they say righteous, it, you, know, you want to be considered a righteous person. And you know, when we give... It's not about what we give, it's how we give. And how we give is out of our heart. And we give out of a joyful heart. Because God loves a cheerful giver, and that's how we give, right? So it's not about how much, it's about how you give, right? So keep that in mind, like, you know, and you can give in other ways. Like, you can give to your neighbors and your friends by just being there for them. Like, you sow seeds wherever you go, and you will reap a harvest. Um, ushers, if you come down, we'll pray for the offering. Pastor has a great word for you guys tonight. I, I was in first service, so I get, the, I get the sneak peek. All right. All right. So, you know, when we give, we trust, right? Again, it's, it's how we give. We give out of our heart. So, Father, we just thank you for an opportunity to sow into your kingdom and to sow into this house. And I just ask, Father, that every seed sown would reap a thousandfold return and that people would leave here blessed to be a blessing. And wherever they would go, they would sow seeds of blessing and they would change this world one person at a time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. everyone. It's so nice to see you. Happy you're all here with us this morning. Happy Palm Sunday. If it's your first time here, welcome to Christian Faith Center. I'm Pastor Nick and honored to have you here with us this morning. Um, we all have palms for you, so on your way out today, you could take a couple palms. Uh, no, I will not help you make a palm cross. I struggled with one today for my son, and that's the only one I'm making. Unless the other son asks for one, but that's a whole different conversation. But you got YouTube, so that's going to be good. Um, you know, we were in a series the past couple of weeks called You Belong. Today, we're just going to study and really focus on Palm Sunday. And uh, if you have your Bible, can you open up to 2 Timothy chapter 3? You can also follow along in the church app. Um, you know, it, how does an, uh, a, a detective or a police officer, how do they investigate a crime scene? Well, you think about that for just a minute. When you see a detective or a police officer and they're, they're called to a crime scene, there, there are a couple things that they're going to do when they get to that crime scene. The first is they're going to look at the evidence that's there. They're going to look at the place where they were called to and see what's there, broken glass, windows, things. They're going to look at everything and they're going to look at the situation. And then what they're going to do is they're going to look at the eyewitnesses and talk to the eyewitnesses. And what a good detective will do is they will separate the eyewitnesses. They're going to talk to this person and get their account, that person, that person, and that person. And what they're going to do is they're going to keep them separated. Why? Because if they keep them together, it's easier for the stories to get jumbled up. 
This happens to me all the time. I, I, I teach middle school as well, and sometimes I have to do some discipline in the school, and I have to call some kids down. And you know something's wrong when what? When all of them have the same exact story. You know. You know. Because if you have kids, this probably happened to you too. How did the window break? This is what we're telling mom and dad. OK? Right? This is, you know. Right? This is what happens. And I know this happens because they'll walk down. I'll call the kids down. They'll meet up in the hallway. They'll all come down together magically at the same exact time. And they'll tell me their version of the story. And I go, yeah, that's not what the cameras show me. And he realized that, oh, snap. <laughs> the story didn't work. Why? Because in, a good detective knows that when they're at a crime scene, they separate the eyewitnesses and they talk to each of them. There are, everybody is going to share some part of what is really true. But it's all based on their perspective of what they saw. And if all of the stories matched up identically, a good police officer would go, none of this is true. But, but when their stories have similar commonalities and similar themes and similar points, but there's little differences, little different nuances, they know that what they're telling is true. Like, for example, you're all looking at my pulpit right now, right? If I said, what do you see? You'd tell me you see a silver pulpit. If you ask me what I see, I say, I see my iPad. I'm not wrong, you're not wrong. You have that perspective, I have this perspective. Now, why is that important? This morning, what we're gonna do is we're gonna study about Palm Sunday, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at it through all four of the Gospels that we have. And we're gonna look at the Gospel authors and their perspective of the events that took place at Palm Sunday, because when we do that, we see the validity of Scripture like it says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And so we can, when we see all, all four of these gospel authors talk about the same exact historical event, but they add different detail and different things to focus on, it doesn't show that the Bible is fallible. It shows that the Bible is infallible. It is what we just read. It is, it is given by inspiration of God to help us learn. Amen? So let's turn to Mark chapter 11. We're going to first look at Mark's account of Palm Sunday. Now, Mark really is named John Mark. It was a Greek and, 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 and you know, Hebrew kind of name, and, and that's why he was called John Mark, but we, we know him as Mark. And so the Gospel of Mark is one of the shortest Gospels. I like it because Mark just gets right to the point. And, and a lot of what he shares in his Gospel, he gets right to the point. And when it comes to the story about Palm Sunday, that, that, that is true too. And all throughout his Gospel, and including Palm Sunday, he gets right to the core of the, of the passage. Look at verse 1. It says, now when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethpage and Bethany and the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples and he said to them, go into the village opposite of you and as you have entered it, you will find a colt tied on which no one has sat. Loose it and bring it here. And if anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say the Lord has need of it and immediately he will send it here. Verse four, so they went their way. They found the colt tied by the door outside the street. They loosed it. But some of those who stood there said to him, exactly what Jesus said, what are you doing loosing the colt? And they spoke just as Jesus had commanded. So they let them go. They, then they brought the colt to Jesus. They threw their clothes on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their clothes in the road. They cut down leafy branches. They cut down palm branches and, and trees and spread them over the road. And then those who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the kingdom of our father David that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. In verse 11. And Jesus went into Jerusalem and into the temple. So when he had looked around at all these things, as the hour was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Now, now here's the important thing. What happens? Jesus rides into Jerusalem on a donkey. They, the people welcome him into the city. They shout, Hosanna. They lay out palm branches. They, they quote Psalm 118. All this prophecy is being fulfilled. Right? Psalm 118 says, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. See, that is what the people were shouting. And what is this showing us? Palm Sunday is so important because prophecy was fulfilled. This is prophecy being fulfilled before our eyes by Jesus. And that was the key. See, Mark gets right to the point. He says, Jesus is the Messiah. He fulfilled prophecy. Then he quotes the prophecy that Jesus fulfilled. And the big difference as we look at the other Gospels is what Mark mentions at the end. 
In verse 11, he says, and Jesus went into Jerusalem and into the temple. See, this is the key here. That Mark points out that Jesus acknowledges the temple. Now, why is this important? Well, three years earlier, Jesus did something at the temple. You might have remembered what he did at the temple. He flipped over the tables. He drove people out of the temple because what they were doing was wrong. See, back then, at the time of Passover, people went. They wanted to honor God with a sacrifice. It was very hard for them to bring their sacrifice, their animal sacrifice. So what was convenient and easier for many people was just to go there and buy the sacrifice. But here was the problem. The problem was the people in the temple were trying to make money, and they were overcharging them for the sacrifice. So Jesus, being the Son of God and God in the flesh, he goes into his Father's house, he sees what they're doing, and he's mad. He's every right to be. They're dishonoring his Father's house. So now fast forward to what we're reading here about Palm Sunday, and here he goes. He's there. He's entering into Jerusalem. He's riding on a donkey, fulfilling prophecy. And as he's entering, he's looking at the temple. And as he's looking at the temple, he sees they're doing the same exact thing they did years earlier. So what happens? Jesus has to go back and address it. So after his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, after everything happens, they lay the palm branches out, they shout out Hosanna, he rides on a donkey, he sees at the temple they're, they're doing stuff, they're doing it again. So what does Jesus do? He decides to go back to the temple. Look at verse 15. So they came to Jerusalem, then Jesus went into the temple and began to drive out those who bought and sold in the temple. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves, and he would not allow any to carry wares through the temple. Then he taught them, saying, "It is is it not written, my house shall be a house of prayer for all nations? He goes, but you have made it a den of thieves. Again, why so important? Three years earlier, Jesus did the same exact thing because they were dishonoring his father's house, but they went back to doing the same stupid thing they did after Jesus drove them out. This was not some spur-of-the-moment decision by Jesus. He saw it. He goes, they're doing it again. I have to defend my father's house. He did this. He sinned, Pastor. No, he didn't. In Hebrews 4.15, it says, we don't have a high priest who can't sympathize with our weakness, but yet in all points, as we are yet without sin. He he had every right to go into his father's house and drive out those who were robbing and stealing people who were there trying to honor God. Does that make sense? So now what's the application? Here it is. Jesus goes in. He sees men dishonoring his father's house. He goes there. He decides, I'm going to defend my father's house. The point for us this morning, we need to defend our father's house. That's the big point. That's what we learn when we study Mark's gospel. Now, we have to defend the Father's house. I mean, let's talk about the church here. We have to defend the church, amen? I'm not just talking about the building. I'm talking about the people in the building as well. That if there is wrong that is happening with anybody in this room, it is our job as a church family to care for them, to defend, to defend the Father's house, to defend those in the house. And we've got to defend our faith too. See, that's what Jesus did. He, de- he defended his father's house. He cared for the Lord's house. And we have to care for the Lord's house and those in the Lord's house. Jesus cared for the word of God. We've got to care for the word of God too. You know, you, know, you know that this isn't just an accessory in your hand. It's supposed to be something held in your heart. You know that, right? We know that. I'm going to say it anyway. The word of God is not to be an accessory to our lives. It's supposed to be our lives. Right? Right, everybody? Like, this is not something that's just to be a part of who I am. This this is who I am. And that's what Jesus reveals here. And that we need to defend our faith like Jesus did. Jesus defended the faith. He defended his Father. He defended the Word of God every single time, every single instance he had. He did. He defended the Word of God. As believers, you know what we need to do? We need to defend the Word of God. It bothers me. It bothers me, and I'm not surprised. It bothers me when you watch the news and you see everything happening in the world around you. Like, that doesn't surprise you. But what really bothers me now is when I see things like this. Like, they're trying to make you feel guilty for being a Christian. The world is trying to make you feel guilty for being a Christian. You know what they do? They call you a Christian national. Christian nationalist. Um, yeah, yeah, amen. Yeah. And, and like, yeah, amen. Sure. Okay. Get the video flagged on YouTube. I don't really care, right? Like, yeah. It's one nation under God. The founding fathers, whether or not you like to believe it or not, were, were founded this nation based on Judeo-Christian values and principles. Many of them were men of faith. And so a lot of this nation, yeah, it was founded, it was one nation under God. It's on our money, it's in our Pledge of Allegiance. I say it every morning in public school. Like, yeah, absolutely, amen, praise God, thank you, Jesus. Yeah, you want to call me a Christian national? Okay, great, I don't care. I don't care, because here's what they're doing. They're trying to gaslight you to not vote in November 
in alignment with your values. I know I have to smile more, I know. It's true, it irritates me because I see it. Why are you, pastor? I'm a believer of the most, I'm a believer in Jesus Christ and I'm in this world but I'm not of this world and while being in this world I see what the world is doing and it bothers me. Because not us, but there are going to be a lot of Christians that fall for this nonsense. They go, oh, I don't know. Oh, I, don't want to vote. I don't want to vote based on my Christian values because I'm a Christian nationalist. I hope you are. Amen. But that's the point. And this is the point. And when we look at the story of Palm Sunday and Mark's gospel, Mark mentions that Jesus went to the temple. And in the temple, Jesus defended his father's house. He defended his father's word. He defended the faith. As believers, this Palm Sunday, please get that, amen? Please get that, that at least one of the things that we need to do that we can learn from Jesus is to defend our faith like he did, amen? amen. Look at John chapter 12. We're going to go to John next. John's account of Palm Sunday. Mark reveals the triumphant entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. Talks about the prophecy being fulfilled, how they laid down the palm branches, they shouted Hosanna, and he, then he mentions the temple, and he mentions, then he talks about the zeal that Jesus had for his father's house. Then we look at the Gospel of John, and John shares something a little bit different, something else that's worth us noting. Look at John 12, 12. It says, The next day a great multitude that had come to the feast, when they had heard Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, and they cried out Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. And then Jesus, when he had found a young donkey, sat on it as it is written. He says, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. Verse 16, underline, highlight, star, whatever you got to do. Box, tweet, stay with me though. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written about him and that they had done these things to him. Did you ever miss something at first, but then get it later? Did you ever not get the joke at first, but then got it 20 minutes later? Yeah, three of us. Praise God. Yeah. Okay, great. Right? You, you're there. They say a joke. It goes over your head. They all laugh. You're like, I don't really get it. And then 20 minutes, like, oh, man. Right? You don't get it at first, but then things start firing off, and things start connecting, and then 30, 20 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes later, you get the joke, right? That was the disciples' lives. They, they were witnessing things for three and a half years. They could not fully comprehend or fathom, but they were there. They were with Jesus. They walked. They heard him. You got to eat my flesh and drink my blood? What is he talking about? That sent a lot of people packing when Jesus said that. They're seeing him, they're seeing all these miracles, these signs, his wonders, they're hearing what Jesus is saying, all the things that he's doing. They're missing a lot of the stuff. And this is not the first time that we read about this. In, in, in John chapter 7, or John chapter 13, verse 7, Jesus said, what I'm doing now you don't understand, but you will know after this. There were a lot of things that, that the disciples, even Palm Sunday, the donkey, the palm branches, right? The people shouting Hosanna. There's a lot of things that they saw that they did not fully get at that time. Do you know what this is called? It's called faith. It's called faith. When you, when you are spending time with God and you don't get something or he asks you to do something or go somewhere or talk to someone and you don't understand why, but you still do it. That's called faith. And when you trust God and you do that, oh man, he's so happy. There are going to be things in your life that the Lord is going to ask you to do that don't make sense now, but one day they will, when or if you stay in faith. That's what John's pointing out. He said, look, the old stuff happened. The disciples, there, they were lost. I was lost. I was there. What happened? We didn't get it then, but we'll get it one day. There are going to be things in your life that the Lord is going to ask you to do that you will not get in the moment, but one day you will. Hey, listen, if nothing else, when your time here is over and you stand before the Lord and he's going to show you the picture of your life and he's going to explain everything that happened in your life, you'll definitely get it then. Even if you don't get it now, you'll get it then. The Bible says we'll know all things as we're known. As you're known by God, you'll know all things from God and for you from God. So when you go and stand before the Lord right? And your life here is over. He's going to show you the picture of your life. Oh, this situation, you know why this happened? Because of this, this, that. Oh, 
It makes sense. The reason why this happened was not because of anything you did. It's because the devil tried to steal, kill, and destroy from you. That's why this was going on here. But see, what happened is I was trying to send this person over there, but, but they struggled to get... Right? Like the Lord is going to reveal all of this stuff to us. So even if you don't get it now, you will get it at one point. See, when, when Jesus was washing the disciples' feet, they didn't get it. And that's what he said in John 13. He goes, you're not going to get this now, but one day you will. There are going to be times in life where God will lead you or instruct you or call you to do something that you won't get in the moment, but one day you will stay in faith. What is faith? Hebrews 11.1. 1. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. You know what's hard? Faith. Faith is hard. Anyone tells you faith is easy, they're lying. Faith is hard. Real faith, real biblical faith, that's hard. You're, you're making decisions based on what the Word of God promises you, not based on what you're seeing. In fact, the decisions you're making are evidenced or proven in the things that are not seen. What does that even mean? You're trusting God's word so fully that you don't, you don't see anything in the tangible, but you're moving because in the spiritual. Does that make sense? It's hard. Faith is hard. Faith is very hard. But the Lord didn't call us to an easy life. He called us to a rewarding life. The word says he rewards those who diligently seek him. And without faith, it's impossible to please him. So what are we going to do? We're going to trust him. Even if you don't get it right now, Keep moving in faith and keep trusting him. Look at Luke chapter 19, please. Luke chapter 19. Mark uses the events on Palm Sunday to lead us to focus on defending our Father's house like Jesus did, to defending our Father's word like Jesus did, and defending our faith like Jesus did. John uses the events on Palm Sunday to lead us to focus on trusting in God and having faith. Listen, again, let me just encourage you this morning. You might not get it now, but one day you will. Don't give up. Amen? Luke uses the events on Palm Sunday just to show us sometimes you just got to move in faith. Luke 19, verse 28. We're reading a lot of Bible today. Isn't that great? I love reading the Word of God. All right. Verse 28. When he, said, when he had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. It came to pass. He drew near to, the Beth, to Bethpage and Bethany. At the Mount, of Olive, Mount called Olive, and he sent two disciples, saying, again, go into the village opposite you, where as you enter it, you'll find a colt tied, on which no one has ever sat. Loose it, bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you loosening it? Thus you shall say to him, because the Lord has need of it. Verse 32. So those who were sent went their way, found it just as Jesus said. But as they were loosening the colt, the owners of it said to him, why are you loosening the colt? They said, the Lord has need of him. And they brought him to Jesus. They threw their clothes on the colt. They sat on him. And as he went, many spread their clothes on the road. In verse 37, then as he was now drawing near to the, to the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, again, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Now here's what's different. Luke makes us hone in on this. In verse 39, some of the Pharisees called him from the crowd, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he, but he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. Amen. Amen. I love what Jesus says. Luke shares the same essential elements of the Palm Sunday story. He says the same exact thing about the donkey, Jesus fulfilling prophecy, the prophecies that were fulfilled, the cheers of the people, the palm branches, everything. He does the same exact thing. He says the same thing that John said, the same thing that Mark said, it's the same thing that Matthew says. And, and then Jesus says, because he makes us focus on what the Pharisees are saying and the response of Jesus. Jesus is saying, listen, what, what, what's happening here was prophesied 4,000 years ago, and it's such an amazing event that it, it, is, it is requiring a response of praise. That, that if the people were quiet at my entrance because it was prophesied over 4,000 years ago in Zechariah 9.9, 9, that if the people were quiet, the rocks would cry out. Because what's happening here deserves this praise. What's happening here is something that my heavenly Father ordained from the beginning of time that would happen. So if the people were standing there quiet, the rocks would cry out. Did you know that everything that God has done and is going to do deserves our highest praise? God does breakthroughs, does miracles in our life, and sometimes we go, 
Thank you, God. And we just go. We live our life. Sometimes we forgot the great things that God did in our past. We forgot what God has rescued us from, saved us from, restored us of, and, and amended us to. And we go, yeah, Lord, thanks. Thanks? He deserves our highest praise. Sometimes we praise people that are not worthy of our praise, when we should be praising God the same way. We praise celebrities, athletes, even like our spouses, higher than we praise God. And the true reality is there, there, are, there is nothing that deserves our praise greater than God. Nothing. Nothing that deserves our praise. God is too good not to celebrate. And that's the point that Luke is emphasizing. Now listen, I get it. Sometimes it's hard to praise. I get it. Sometimes it's hard to praise. Sometimes you don't feel like praising. Sometimes it's challenging. Sometimes life just feels like it's overwhelming you and you don't feel like you have anything in you to praise God for. Let me give you three things right now. Number one, you are here. You can see me and you can hear me. You can understand what is coming out of my mouth and going into your mind and in your spirit this morning. Praise God for that. You have life, you have breath, you have vision, you have hearing, you have sight. You got here today. You got in that seat today. You are here today. Give God praise for that. If nothing else, that is more than enough to praise God for. It. But see, what happens? We lose it. We lose sight. We lose sight of it. And it's so easy to lose sight of things. And there, listen, there are things that happen in our lives. There are things that are hard in our lives. And sometimes you don't feel like praising. You don't feel like that you can give him breath. Remember, he is the one that gave you that breath. Sometimes praising him is hard. It's challenging. You get so distracted, you can't do it. But you cannot forget the one that gave you that breath. Because you know what happens? Sometimes praise feels like a sacrifice. Sometimes it feels hard. Sometimes you think, well, I don't like this song in praise and worship. So you don't sing. Hey, guess what? Praise and worship is not for you. It's for God. Who cares if you don't like the song? It's not for you. It's for God. Who cares if you can't sing good? God doesn't care about how, how good you are, how pitchy you might be. Sing. It's not for me. It's not for Nick. And it's not for the worship team. It's for God. Is God worthy of it? Absolutely he is. I don't like the song. Who cares? Worship him anyway. I don't feel like worshiping him. Great. You got breath? Sing. Give it to God. It's a sacrifice. Yes. Praise is a sacrifice. That's what Hebrews says. Therefore, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. Yeah, it's a sacrifice. You want to show up late because you don't want to sing? I get it. Where are you, pastor? I'm here at 7 o'clock in the morning. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Okay? If you're wondering where I am, I'm here at 7 o'clock in the morning praising. Right? Like, I get it. Sometimes it's hard, but you know what? It's a sacrifice of praise. It's called a sacrifice because it costs you something. It's going to cost your flesh from taking over. It's going to cost your emotions from taking over. It's going to cost the lies of the enemy ruling your life when you have that sacrifice of praise. I feel far from, from the Lord, Pastor. I can't praise. You know the solution? If you feel far from God and getting close to God is praising Him. Psalm 100, verse 2. It says, serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with? Singing. With singing. I don't feel close. I feel far. I don't feel like praising. Great. You have to sing. You have to praise him. I don't feel like it. Great. You have to. Like, I don't I'll tell you. I don't really, really care. <laughs> you have to do it. I don't feel like it. Great. Sometimes I don't feel like doing things that I have to do. Guess what I do? How many of you love waking up and going to work every single morning? Not a single hand went up. Y'all got to find new jobs. Oh, my goodness. Not a single hand raised. That was what we're going to pray for. A lot of open doors this morning as you leave church this morning. Wow. <laughs> but you show up, right? But you show up because sometimes you just got to go do things. Sometimes you got to just praise them, especially when you don't feel like it. Sacrifice. But here's what you do. When you come to him in praise and you praise him in faith, man, God opens doors. When you don't feel like it and you just do it, you find reasons to pray. It's like a snowball effect. It's like an avalanche. You throw a rock at a mountain and you, you start praising. You're like, oh Lord, I, oh, Lord, I just thank you for me just being alive, Lord. And you start praising him. You start thanking him. All of a sudden, you start thinking of other things. Like, yeah, Lord, I thank you that 
Lord, I thank you that I have a marriage. Lord, I thank you that my family serves you. Thank you that my family knows you. Lord, I thank you that my family's been faithfully knowing you for years. Lord, I thank you that even though I've gone through X, Y, and Z with my spouse, I know that you're going to do this. You're going to go, this is going to be a snowball effect of praise that happens. Why? Because you just pressed on and pressed them. Amen? Sometimes you got to just praise them anyway. Look at Matthew chapter 21. We're going to close with Matthew's account. We're studying Palm Sunday. Mark focuses on us defending our faith. John tells us again in this story, he reveals that we got to live by faith. Luke reveals that we got to praise sometimes in faith. When you don't feel like it, you got to do it. Matthew reveals something that's important. It's again who we put our faith in. Matthew chapter 21. We're going to verse 1. I, I like reading the whole passage every single time. I think it's good for us. That's why we're doing it. Right? Like, you know, I can just keep talking, I'm not trying to fill time. I can talk. Hallelujah. Right? Like I saw, I'm, I'm, I'm doing it so that we, we go through the scriptures and see the complete passage every single time. Okay? And you have it when you go home. Palm Sunday, you have every passage there. Okay? Verse 1. Again, when they drew near to Jerusalem, they came to Bethpage, the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village opposite of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Loose them. Bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say to them, The Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. Verse 4, and all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you, lowly and sitting on a donkey, the colt, a colt, the foal of a donkey. So the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. They brought the donkey and the colt, laid their clothes on them, and set them on them. And a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down the branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the multitudes who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. And those are the two words that we're going to focus on right now in this passage. It's Hosanna and prophet. That's what we're going to focus on when we look at this account, in Matthew's account. Hosanna was a Hebrew expression. That expression meant help or save us. So now when they're saying Hosanna and they're attributing it to Jesus, they're calling him the one who helps or the one who saves. They're calling him Savior. They're claiming Jesus as Savior. And they refer to Jesus as a prophet. Why? Because days earlier, the reason why there was a massive crowd, one of the many reasons why is because Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. He was dead for days. He shows up at the tomb. The sisters are like, he's dead. He goes, great, roll the tomb away. We're going to come back. They're like, Lord, he stinks. His body is decaying right now. He goes, I don't care. Lazarus, come forth. What happens? In his grave cloths, he comes, he walks, and is alive perfectly well and functioning, and people saw it. So what was this? Well, they said, he's, he's something special. They call him a prophet. He's a savior. He's a prophet. But here's the problem. See, they called him savior because at that time, they were under Roman rule. And what they really wanted was a king to free them from Roman rule. And when they saw Jesus as prophet, they saw him as a miracle worker. Oh, he's the one that lays Lazarus, Lazarus from the dead. I wonder if he can do something like that for me. See, the problem is they were focusing on Jesus in the natural, and his mission was way beyond that. They wanted him to be a literal king. He is king of kings and lord of lords. Amen? He was not here just to establish an earthly kingdom. He has a heavenly kingdom that he rules and reigns over. He did not come just to heal people during his earthly ministry. He came and made a way for generations to experience healing, for generations to experience it's the most heartbreaking part of Palm Sunday to me. They were only concerned with what Jesus could do in the physical. We want a literal king, and they see him beat up and before Pilate, and, they're, and they're, they see him before Pilate, and they see him beat up. They're like, oh, no, that's, that's not, it can't be him, Right? They think, well, he's, he's going to be our savior. He's going to free us from Roman rule. And they, and they don't see that. They go, well, maybe he's not king. Or he's a prophet. They do miracle workers. But here he is. He's hanging on a cross. That's, this is weird. Maybe he's not that, right? So they see all these things. And why? Because they were limiting Jesus to just the physical. But Jesus came to do more. They missed it. We won't. They, they missed it. 
We won't. And in the same way that the disciples didn't get it when they were with Jesus, we get it. Amen? That you and I, we get it, not because of what they thought. You know what's true today? He still wants to do more in your life. Ephesians 3.20. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. Do you, do you know why we pray? Do you know why we speak with authority? over situations and illness. You know, we prayed for that little girl here. We came into agreement because, because he wants to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask, think, or imagine. But it's according to the power that works in you. When you're born again, your spirit is the same spirit. It's joined with the same spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. You don't got a lesser version of Jesus, the Holy Spirit inside of you. You don't got 2.0. You got the Holy Spirit of God on the inside of you. That, that the Lord wants you to use and exercise with the authority that he's given to you through Christ Jesus. So it's not according to him up there in heaven. It's according to the power at work in you. So that you can go lay hands on the sick. So that you can speak to illness and watch it leave. So that you can cast out demons. So that you can set people free through the power of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. And see, they missed it. They, missed, they thought Jesus was just going to do this for them. And, and he had such greater plans. God has greater plans for you too beyond what you think. Amen? Can you close your Bibles, please? I was so excited studying for this this morning. I love, I love what the Lord was revealing to me. I looked at the story of Palm Sunday through each of these gospel authors. Prophecy fulfilled. Jesus was and is our Savior. And then Mark makes us focus on our need to defend our faith. John makes us focus on our need to live by faith. Luke reveals that sometimes you've got to just praise in faith. And Matthew shows us the importance of who to put our faith in. We looked at these different perspectives from all these different gospel authors and how they viewed the same event. But the important question, the million-dollar question today is how do you view Palm Sunday? What do you see when Jesus is entering that, that city? Do you just limit it to a story about Jesus and that's it? Or do you realize that there's more? Do, do you realize that he's Savior? He's Redeemer? He's Hosanna? Do you realize that he fulfilled, he fulfilled the prophecy that, that was meant for him to fulfill? That Palm Sunday wasn't just another day, but it was a day that clearly demonstrated that he is the Messiah. And see, when we get that, what does it do? It prompts us to live a life of faith and to live a life for him. Amen? Let's bow our heads. Let's close in prayer. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name, and Lord, we just love you. Lord, I thank you so much for your word and the power that, that you've given to us through your Holy Spirit so we can lay hands on the sick and, and see them recover. And so, Father, we just pray right now for this word being sealed in our hearts, Lord, so that we can go out and, and live it and use what you've taught us today to impact the world around us for the better. You are Hosanna. You are Emmanuel. You're God with us. We thank you for that, Lord. Pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you can keep your head bowed, please, for just another moment or so. This, in fact, is the, the most important part of the service. We always say it because it's always true. That if you have never made Jesus the Lord of, of your life, if he, if he is not your Lord and Savior, do so today. Do so today. The Bible says you have to believe in your heart and confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, and you'll be saved. So this morning, do just that. Say this prayer out loud. We'll, we'll all say it together with you. Everyone say, Jesus. Say, be my Lord. Be my Savior. Say, I believe you died on the cross for my sins. And I believe you're alive from the dead. Lord, live in me. Lord, work in me. In Jesus' name, amen. If you can keep your head bowed, please, and just keep praying. If that was you today, if you... If you gave your heart to Jesus, if you said that prayer and you meant it today for the first time, uh, we're so happy for you. 
we're excited for you. Um, and I'm going to ask you to do, do me one favor. It's just raise your hand. That's all I'm going to ask you to do. That if you said that prayer today for the first time and you made Jesus the Lord of your life, just where you are in your seat, just lift your hand up where you are. That's all I'm going to ask you to do. Praise God, I see that hand. Praise God, I see that hand. I see that hand too. I see that hand as well. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Father, I thank you for those in this room this morning, Lord, that gave their hearts to you. The Lord, your word says that they are a new creation in Christ Jesus, that the old has passed away and everything is new. Lord, I pray that they see themselves the way that you see them, Lord, as forgiven, as a daughter, as a son. And Lord, I thank you for the newness of life that they have and we all have because of Jesus Christ. I thank you, Lord, for new beginnings and fresh starts and new chapters over them and, Lord, over everybody in this room. That as we leave here today, this Palm Sunday, that for those that gave their heart to you today, today, Lord, it's going to be a day that they never forget. And, Lord, that today, for the rest of us here, Lord, that have been following you and faithfully trusting in you in our lives, that, Lord, today is going to be the first day of a whole new future with you where we are excited about what you are going to do and passionate to serve you, Lord. Father, we thank you for all these things, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. So happy to see you all here today. I'm going to encourage you to come back next Sunday. It's going to be good. It's good. I know what you're thinking. Are there going to be enough seats? You show up. We'll be all right. Good problems. Good problems. Now, we're going to have some extra seating out next Sunday, and we'll make room for you guys, but keep coming. Keep coming. The best thing you can do is for, for those that they give their heart to Jesus today is to have that relationship and then continue in that relationship with Jesus. You do that by, by keep on coming. Amen? Amen? Amen. I'm going to ask Tanisha to come up and she's going to go over a couple quick announcements and then she's going to close in prayer. You know that we love you and your families. God loves you and your families. Um, before, before Tanisha goes real quick, I just want to thank you all again for continuing to support the ministry. Um, you know, we... We finished our little bathroom renovation we got back there. So you can poke your head on the way out. Um, and we're in the process of wrapping up the kids' classrooms downstairs. And a lot of great things. And again, it's because you, you get blessed when you give. We say it every single time, right? It's more blessed to give to receive. But thank you for continuing to be faithful in sowing um, because it allows us to then pour into the next generation. That's what matters. God bless everyone. Have a great day. Good afternoon, everyone. All right, so we have, we have a couple of announcements. Um, so the first one is if you're interested in the singles event, I think we have a QR code. Please scan that QR code and let us know so that we can organize something. Um, the next one is that auditions are happening soon for joining the worship team. So if you want to join the worship team, scan the QR code. You can also talk to Nick Z over here. Um, if you're interested in that, auditions will be very, very soon. It's on uh, April 5th. So please let us know about that. Uh, March 27th, this coming Wednesday, is Coffee and Questions with Pastor Nick. So if you have questions you would like to submit, you can submit those in the church app today. Um, and then this Friday, you all know, is Good Friday. Um, the youth will be doing a program at 6.30 p.m. The youth always do an amazing job. Every time they run an event, every time they do something up here for us, it is amazing. So please come out to, you know, receive something, but also to support our youth because what they're doing is really fantastic. Um, and then finally, Easter Sunday will be next Sunday, and we will be having the 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. service Please invite someone, a friend, family member, um, anyone you know who might be unchurched. Please invite them to join us um, to worship and celebrate um, the resurrection of Jesus. Um, I was thinking as I was sitting there, this just came to my mind today, and it was uh, I think it was God, um, that I realized that this time of year, the days get a little longer, right? We, we have the daylight savings time. There's like you know, all this light for us. And I don't think it's a coincidence that we experience more light during the resurrection season. 
I don't think that's a coincidence at all. That It literally just came to me. And I also don't think it's a coincidence that this is the time of year that people start cleaning and getting rid of the old and like refreshing their homes, right? Like getting the junk out and, and bringing in the good stuff. I do not think that's a coincidence. I think that be, that's because we were made to want light and desire light and made to want to, you know, get rid of the old and the junky and receive the new refreshing spirit that comes from God. I think we were made that way because we're made in God's image and we just have that desire. And I think there's just something about resurrection season that makes all of us as people want to do things to be renewed and refreshed, right? And we experience that light. So it just came to me as I was sitting there. So I wanted to share that with you. I'm going to close in prayer. Lord, thank you for your light. Thank you for the longer days. You know, sometimes we hate the, the shift with daylight saving time, but it really is a blessing for us because the days get a little longer. We get to experience that sunshine of just a little bit longer. And I think that's a positive thing, Lord. I, I ask that you continue to renew and refresh us, continue to lead us to people that don't know you, that we could share a word or encouragement with them. And again, that you would put maybe one or two people on our hearts that we can extend an invitation to. And, and all we do is extend the invitation and the Holy Spirit does the rest. So I pray that you give us the confidence to do that and take away any fears from doing that. And, you know, that you continue to guide us and just thank you for this season and for your sacrifice in Jesus name. Amen. <laughs>